Hey, yo, alright man, look, on February 21st, 1986, the Legend of Zelda series began, and now, as of the making of this video, that game is a week shy of its 35th birthday, and Breath of the Wild is the most current Zelda release. Some of you may recall when Breath of the Wild first came out and everything was so new with the concept of being able to complete the main story quest in any order, if even at all, and go straight to Ganon with three hearts if you wanted to, that Nintendo stated somewhere in there that that's the kind of Zelda game they've been trying to create all along. The technology necessary to create their vision just wasn't there yet. So I decided to give the original another shot, because I tried playing it in the past and I quickly gave up on it for reasons I'll get into in a moment, but this time with the help of the internet including a beautiful map of the overworld, I was able to play through the full game and experience everything and I had a blast of an experience doing so. And of course, many of the features in the original game were also in Breath of the Wild. Most notably, both games begin with an encounter with a mysterious old man who gives you an essential item. In Breath of the Wild, you meet him as soon as you exit a cave tucked away in the rock, and in the original, he's right there as soon as you enter a little cave. Albeit in Breath of the Wild, we have to jump through a few hoops and get several other items first before the old man hands over the goods, but I'll digress. Moblins, Keys, Stalfos, Wizrobes, Octoroks, and Lynels all appeared as enemies in both titles. But the original does have way more enemy variety, which is one of the things I'd like to see expanded upon in the sequel to Breath of the Wild. Both games also have special arrows for the sole purpose of defeating Ganon. They were called Silver Arrows in the original, and Light Arrows in Breath of the Wild. And hey yo, speaking of which, is that blood? They say it's a pile of ashes, but that looks like a bloody mess. And finally, as far as my personal experience goes, both games get progressively easier as you go through and collect more powerful items, weapons, clothing, and of course, heart containers. I honestly believe that most of the difficulty and unintuitive features in the original are simply the result of a team that had never done anything like this before, and they didn't have any other epic adventure fantasy games to draw inspiration from either, so it was very experimental in that respect. It's essentially an open world game on an 8-bit cartridge. There's minimal map cutoff until you acquire a few items along the way, and you can make it to the last dungeon pretty early in the game, although you can't make it further than the first room until you've completed all the previous dungeons. That said, although I haven't tried it myself, I do believe that there are several ways to complete the dungeons out of the intended sequential order. Before it was available as part of the Switch Online collection, I tried playing it on an emulator and I was so lost. There's just so many different choices to go straight from the beginning, and each square leads to another series of directional choices, and I would have enjoyed exploring the map and going in completely blind like that from the onset if I had even felt like I had a moment to breathe, or at least a fighting chance at not getting a annihilated every two or three squares. The game says includes invaluable maps and strategic playing tips on the cover, but I couldn't find any of that on the Switch Online version, so I'm hoping that people back in the day got to sit down next to the instruction booklet that games used to come with as a reference guide, the same way that I sat down next to my laptop, because the overworld map in game is a big gray block with a green marker that show your position, and that's it. Just when I started to understand the lay of the land and feel my first wave of confidence in trying to explore, I started running into repeating sequences that would keep that green marker in the same position seemingly no matter how many times I tried to move in any given direction. On one hand I wish they would have left that part out, but on the other I realized that that was their first attempt at a Lost Woods kind of concept, and it's really the best that they could do at the time, so it's cool to see in looking back on it. Still, with all the little things that create big frustrations, it's hard to comprehend how anybody gave this game a shot back in the day before save states. Given the sheer difficulty, the absolutely unrelenting enemies on every single screen except the home square, they tell you right from the start that it's dangerous, but bruh. The moment that you take even half a heart of damage, your sword decreases in power tremendously as it no longer shoots the magical beam which for me was an essential part of beating this game. Early Zelda titles are infamous for their multiple mandatory challenges and puzzles with absolutely no hint or point in the right direction at all, and the few in-game hints that you do get can be extremely cryptic. This game is no different, which is cool for the deep free thinker and explorer types out there, but when the dungeon map shows a blank space where there's not supposed to be a room so you can't figure out what to do, and the walkthrough tells you to bomb the wall adjoining the blank space to open up a secret passage, but that wall doesn't have any markings to 
distinguished, that it's weak and breakable. Like what you've been trained to look out for in more recent Zelda games you may have played where you can look at it and say, hmm, you know, I think that wall is bombable. In this game, there's no such aesthetic difference in the walls to clue you into something special about them, so it's easy to remain in bomb scarcity as you use them up on walls trying to find weak spots. But we were forewarned, and as difficult as the game is, you always get the option to save when you game over, so you'll always be able to build up incremental progress with the right approach and mindset. Fortunately, with the use of save states, I was able to minimize or completely avoid all frustrations while playing this game, and I was able to come out on the other side of it and say, you know what, that was their first try, that was the best that they could do, and they did an awesome job, all things considered. They pushed the NES to its absolute maximum. There are plenty of rooms in multiple dungeons where the frame rate plummets horrendously low because it just can't process all the different enemies moving around. It's kind of comical, but once you take out a couple of them, they start moving around faster and more fluidly the way they're supposed to, and it actually makes them more difficult even though there's fewer of them. Which could have been purposeful design by Nintendo, or it could just be that they put as many bad guys as they could fit in a room without crashing the game. Either way, against the odds this game went on to be so successful that it not only got the green light for a direct sequel a year later, but 35 years later some guy is talking about it on a YouTube video while we wait for another direct sequel to a Zelda game that more accurately captured that initial vision they had for the original game three decades earlier, and it went on to win Game of the Year 2018. It's an undeniable accomplishment. They've learned so much over the years through trial and error while designing the puzzles, dungeons, and overworlds, and that's exactly why I'm excited about the sequel to Breath of the Wild. Playing through the first installment of the series helped me develop a better appreciation for just how far the series has come, yet how true it's stayed to its roots, and I highly recommend you give it a try if you haven't already yourself. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on it. Leave yours in the comments. Did I miss anything interesting? Let me know. Subscribe if you're new and you want to stay current. Hit the bell to catch things first. And of course, please like the video if you did indeed like it. And ditto if you dislike. Engagement's engagement. But anyway, thank you so very much for watching. I really, truly do appreciate every single one of you and your time and your attention. So until next time, please stay well, stay cool, and always keep punching out there. Aloha.